Hey, welcome to The Greenhouse. I'm Alex. Every day, the sun delivers more energy to the surface of the Earth in one hour than all the people on Earth use in an entire year. Why don't we use more solar energy? It's renewable and carbon-free, and plants have used solar energy to power global ecosystems for millions of years. What if we could use energy more like plants do? Turns out, we can. Plants are the powerhouses of the natural world, converting energy from the sun into chemical energy for growth. As a human community, we want to power not only our own organic growth, we also want to power our homes, our transportation, our business and industries. To do that with sunlight, we need to convert the sun's energy into electrical energy. And we can still follow the lead of plants in doing that by using natural or synthetic plant pigments to make dye-sensitized solar cells. First, let's look at what we need on the electricity side of the system. Electricity is just electrical charge in motion. To create motion of any kind, we need to provide a gradient. A gradient is a set of unequal conditions. When everything is the same everywhere, nothing happens. For example, when the slope of this surface is zero, nothing moves. But if I tilt it to give it a topographic gradient, then the train cars move. The same is true with electrical charge. We need to provide a charge gradient. And that's what our little solar cell is going to do. It's a zone of unequal charge that'll get some electrons moving. Creating that gradient requires an input of energy. In the case of a solar cell, that's going to be energy from the sun. Then, in order to keep the electrons moving, we need a circuit, a pathway that continually loops the charges through the gradient, like a track for a train or a wire loop for electric charge. Here's a super simple circuit. I've got two wires, in this case connected through a tiny lamp. In this circuit, the voltage gradient is going to come from the chemical energy in this button battery. We insert our gradient, and the way we know that the charges are moving is that the lamp lights up. So let's make a solar cell and see what we can do with it. Solar cells are little sandwiches of different materials that work together to create a voltage when solar energy strikes the cell. The cell we'll make is called a dye-sensitized cell because the material that's going to respond to sunlight is a photoreactive plant dye. We could use chlorophyll from leaves, but here I'm going to use raspberries, and specifically the anthocyanin dye that makes them red. The materials that I'm using to make these solar cells come from the Cornell Center for Materials Research Lending Library of Experiments. You can find out more about that in the description below. We're going to make a six-layer solar sandwich, and here are the ingredients. Two glass plates make a frame that will hold the sandwich together and allow sunlight to pass through. This is special glass with a conductive tin coating called transparent conducting oxide glass, or TCO. Each piece of glass is going to have a second material applied to it, making one side an electrode and the other a counter-electrode. The electrode is the side that's going to be energized by sunlight, and we need two materials working together to make that happen. We've got titanium dioxide, which is a semiconductor, and the raspberry juice, which is a source of photoreactive electrons. We're going to apply a very thin, smooth layer of titanium dioxide and heat it so that it adheres to the slide. First, we'll mix the titanium dioxide powder with some vinegar and carefully spread it over the surface of the slide. Then we'll heat it, a process called sintering. This makes the titanium dioxide particles bond together in a very porous structure that will also hold the berry juice in place. While the glass cooled down, we've smushed up the berries to make juice. We'll soak the slide face down so that the juice can flow into all the nanopore spaces created by the titanium dioxide. While that's happening, we'll make the counter electrode by using a candle flame to coat the second slide with carbon. Now we'll put the electrode and counter electrode together and hold them with binder clips. Then we need to add one last layer. On a nanoscale, both sides of our solar cell have very rough surfaces, so we need to make sure that there's complete and continuous connection between the two sides, and we want that connection to be able to move electrons. So we'll fill in the gaps with an electrolyte, a conducting liquid, in this case, an iodide solution. The iodide is a great electrolyte because it easily transfers electrons by changing its molecular structure. So it not only keeps the electrode and counter-electrode in contact, but efficiently moves electrons from one side to the other. A few drops of iodide will soak through the cell and fill any remaining gaps, and we're ready to go. Now I've assembled this quickly but you'll find the step-by-step -step instructions in the video linked here from the Cornell Center for Materials Research 
and in the description of this video below. Now we'll create a circuit by connecting a wire to the electrode and one to the counter electrode, and then put the solar cell in the sun and see if we've managed to get some electrons moving. The easiest way to see that is to use a voltmeter and see if it registers the energy gradient that we tried to create, which it does. By building this little sandwich, we've created the voltage gradient we need to move electrons, something that none of the individual ingredients could do on their own. Of course, we want our solar cell to do some useful work for us, so let's connect it to a little electronic device. First, I've actually assembled four little cells, and I'm going to link all four of them in series, which will quadruple the voltage and give me enough juice to power a little electronic music box. Check it out. One other interesting thing to look at is the effect of the intensity of the sunlight on the voltage of the solar cells. When I tip the panels to get direct sunlight, I get the maximum voltage. When I tilt them away from the direct sunlight, the voltage decreases. So you can see that with enough solar cells, and especially cells that can track the sun, it's not hard to power everything in our house, or even an entire city, using energy from the sun. To be able to do that at large scale and at low price, there's a lot of research being done on different types of solar cells. One of the most interesting applications is to use solar cells as part of the design or structure of a building. These are called building integrated photovoltaics, and it's one way that dye sensitized solar cells are currently used. Here are dye sensitized solar cells on the upper floors of the Science Tower in Graz, Austria. And here they are in the windows in the conference center in Lausanne, Switzerland. Because they're transparent and colorful, they not only make the building attractive, but they provide power as well. How cool is that? 